In this segment, I'm joined by my colleague, Tulia Iori, who's a professor at the University of Roma, Tor Vergata. And she is a true expert on Nervi, and I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thanks to you. Tulia's research focuses on the history of construction. Currently, she's fully involved with research on the history of structural engineering in Italy, and she was the co-curator of the exhibition on Pier Luigi Neri in Maxi in Rome from 2010 to 2011, and again, an exhibition in Rome in 2014. And she is the author of many papers and books on Nervi. So Tulia, we left off last time where I talked about the Nervi system, uh, Nervi's innovations in construction. And I talked about prefabrication. Can you tell us now about ferro cement and what that is and how he used it in his first structure? Sure. Ferro concrete, ferro cement, it's the same is a sort of a genetic mutation of reinforced concrete because the materials, the components, are the same, rebars, steel, and concrete, but they are combinated in a very new way. So the rate of uh, rebars are very high uh, in comparison with an ordinary reinforced concrete. In ferrocement, Nervi put uh, wire. So this is a wire mesh where you have steel in two directions. It's a mesh yes, of steel. Yes, sure, and that. Okay. Okay. And then with a trowel, you can spread the concrete on this net. And you form a 2.5 maximum centimeter of ferroconcrete. Okay. So you have a material that is very resistant because it's very similar to steel, but it's very ductile, right. very elastic more similar to steel than to ferro-concrete, but it is cheap. Steel wire are very cheap in yes. that moment in Italy, and maybe they were the only material that Nervi could really found in a war period. So this material so. was patented in 1943 for the first time, and then it was uh, um, developed and, uh, in 1944, and then used for the first time in some boats, and in a building, Via della Magliana, in Rome. It's uh, the warehouse of uh, his company. Uh, and he was a prototype made entirely in ferro-concrete. So it's a building uh, 20 meter long and 12 meter wide. So it's a built building. But every part of this building, also the, the, the soil of the windows, are made in ferro-concrete. So the window sills are made in concrete and the walls of this building yeah, are the, made in, the, in ferro concrete or ferro-cement. Yes, the and the, the walls in ferro-concrete, so 2.5 centimeters, but they are resistant by form. So they're cor corrugated, yeah, they waved are forms. Undulated, undulated, so in a very yes. beautiful way. Yes. And this resistance, uh, the resistance of these walls in only by the form, because otherwise with 2.5 centimeters of materials, you can really reach the right uh, resistance. So to build this building, they put up the wire mesh first, and then yes. by hand, the and workers... by hand. So that must have been very difficult, correct? Very difficult, very hard so. and very tiring for the manpower. So Nervi understood in that moment, in that uh, experience, in that test, mm -hmm. that he, can't, he couldn't use ferro-concrete in cast in place, so produce in place. You have to combine the two patents, the two invention, and to create the Nervi system. So he produced in ferro-concrete prefabricated elements on the ground, and then he put these elements on a scaffold and we rejoin with the cast-in-place uh, concrete. So through this experience of building this building on site in this way, he learned he needed to use both ferro-cement and prefabrication together to yeah. make it a, to make ferro-cement an effective construction method. Yes. That's yes. wonderful. So then the the first major structure he built in ferro-cement, I think, was in Turin, is yeah. that correct? Yes, it was an exhibition for uh, um, an exhibition of carts. It was a very big building built in a very short time using all the potentialities of uh, the Nervi system because he could divide the, the, the work in two parts. In a part, he pre prefabricated the pieces, the waves that uh, form the big vault and in the other part, in the real part of uh, the worksite, he started to um, cast in place 
pillars and yeah. the other permanent source. So basically he's using ferrocement, prefabrication and cast in place all together yeah, to create yeah. it's a structure. Mixed it's construction. a mixed construction. Yeah, yeah. So now we move into the scientific aspect of this lecture where we look at Nervi's inspiration, his inspiration through efficient ribbed forms. And we start by examining this Turin exhibition hall that's really one of his wonderful masterpieces. So as Tulia said, it opened in uh, 1948 for an automobile exhibition and in only 10 months, which is absolutely amazing that such a structure could be built in only 10 months. And it instantly recognized Nervi uh, for not only his talents in structural engineering, but also as Nervi the artist. The Turin Exhibition Hall is made up of, you could say, several arches, and these arches are divided into segments, about four meters long, uh, two meters wide, and one and a half meters deep. And it was like putting together pieces of a puzzle, right? It yeah. was, these are all prefabricated ferro-cement segments of these wave elements that were um, assembled. So let's go over that assembly process in slowly and in detail so that the audience can understand how he built this. The first step was starting the casting place uh, work and uh, in the same month they started to produce these uh, waves, this part of waves uh, which are um, made of ferro-concrete, so very light, they can be moved near the construction site and uh, a lot of workers can work, so this work goes very fast because of all the workers by hand can produce a lot of pieces in the same time. Mm -hmm. At the end, they put these waves with their diaphragm. So the diaphragm is important here because each of these segments have to be lifted by a crane. Absolutely. And so they have to be stiff enough not to be deformed yeah, when being yeah, lifted. Yeah. So there's not, this not diaphragm. To change the form, right. absolutely. Right. So they, they put these uh, uh, waves on the top of the Innocenti scaffolding. So a segment on wheels, you can move it. So this Innocenti, you call the Innocenti scaffold. There's a special scaffold that Nervi used throughout his works. It's very special for him and his projects. Yeah, it's, right. a, it's a scaffold that was very diffuse in Italy in that moment. It was uh, the invisible uh, protagonist of the construction of a lot of uh, um, engineering works, like the bridges uh, on the high, highway of the sun. And it was a, a really, it was everywhere in mm -hmm. Italy. So then the crane comes and picks up these prefabricated pieces and it sits on top of the scaffold and all these prefabricated uh, ferro cement or ferro concrete pieces are together but then they have to be joined. Yes, so there is uh, a cast in place uh, part mm -hmm. uh, which rejoined all the pieces and create a monolithic again. So the prefabricated segments must have protruding steel or protruding segments in them to have absolutely to have absolutely. the joint. So right? you, you, you will have a casting place on the down of the waves and on the top of the waves. So two lines of ribs that work together with yeah. the membranal part of the ferro-concrete. Wonderful, very clever. And together you can see how all of this assembles into a very elegant space that was very economically designed. And because these prefabricated segments had spaces for windows, we have a lot of natural light that enters this large roofed covering. One of my favorite quotes from Nervi is where he says that new structural ideas are useless unless they are based on practical and efficient construction procedures. And this speaks to something that uh, I've spoken about before and probably will continue to talk about in the lectures to come, the idea that as a designer you can't just design something without thinking about how it will be built because it's possible that your design can't be constructed, it's impossible, or if it can be constructed it could be too expensive and thus kill the project. Neri was very much thinking about that construction process as he was thinking about his design. For him, the two went together, design and construction. Another thing that I speak about often is this idea that creativity takes courage. And I've been illustrating this with many structural artists that I lecture on, not only in this class, but in others. 
And it's the idea that these designers have the courage to try new materials, new forms, new construction practices. And we see this with Neri, the courage that he had to try things that hadn't been tried before. Neri was keenly aware of the courage needed by the designer to try new things, but also the courage of the client to accept the designer's innovations. In Neri's words, the designer, after a thorough study of the problem and under the impulse of his creativity, is naturally and understandably daring. The courageous decision of the client is to be admired much more, since it must be unemotional and must weigh, on one hand, this desire to build a structure in which he believes, but which will not necessarily be identified with him, and on the other hand, his personal loss if it should fail. Along these lines, Neri refers to the exhibition hall in Turin, where he says, quote, I was never more keenly conscious of the joint responsibility that the client shares with his designer, even if only of a moral one, than when the heads of the Turin exhibition board, seeking reassurance that my design for the roof of the great hall was structurally sound, asked me whether I could refer them to works of similar nature. I couldn't and my silence necessarily induced a momentary feeling of doubt and uncertainty. A more timid client, one of narrower vision, would certainly have abandoned the project in favor of a less economical and more trivial solution. In addition to this uh, great exhibition hall with the waved prefabricated forms, at the end of the hall is a beautiful half dome built also using the same Nervi system, but in a different way with a slightly different technique. Maybe, Tulia, you can talk about what is a called a tabelloni. Oh, yes, and how we use that. Tabelloni is a form, normally rhomboidal form, which uh, is used to create the dome. So the dome was broke in uh, a thousand of pieces that were prepared on the prefabrication work inside. And these pieces, uh, when you put uh, uh, one uh, near the other, they form a sort of channel that you can use for the cast in place ribs. Uh, so uh, they are a sort of false work, but that are included inside the dome. They give resistance to the, to the dome. The most important uh, use of this Mm, rhomboidal uh, tavelloni is in this building in the Palazzetto dello Sport. So in the image uh, that you see, you see this ferro cement then is used as part of the permanent construction of the structure. And just like in the exhibition hall, there's cast in place concrete that's placed on top of that. And yeah. because these tavelloni have these little uh, lips or ribs at the end, it forms a channel that forms the ribs. More Absolutely. or less, right? So, right. and like you said, it's hundreds or maybe thousands of little pieces that are put together to yeah. assemble the entire structure. So very clever design, and again, very similar to the design or the way the structure that we're standing in was built. In addition to using ferro cement and uh, prefabrication for being part of the permanent part of the structure, sometimes he used it not as the permanent part of the structure, but as a reusable form where in the case, for example, for the new tobacco factory in Bologna of 1949, these prefabricated ferro-cement forms were used to form essentially ribs for a slab, a flat slab, no longer a dome, just a flat slab. And in the same way, this, these ferro-cement forms are placed on top of, I think it's also Innocenti scaffold, the same thing? With wheels. With wheels this time, yeah. movable forms on wheels. So these uh, forms are placed on top of a platform, which is placed on top of the scaffold. Then the concrete is poured. Before that, of course, we have the reinforcing steel. When the concrete hardens, this form is lowered, correct? And then this formwork on wheels moves to the next location, lifted, poured. So by reusing this form and using these uh, Innocenti scaffold on wheels, uh, we have an economy of construction using ferro-cement and prefabrication in a different way. Also in this case, by not using wooden forms, Neri liberates himself from rigid shapes with sharp corners. So we have, you can see in the Bologna uh, tobacco factory, these corners are rounded, which creates a, a different aesthetic. I think it's more aesthetic than just uh, square corners that we would normally see for these kinds of rib slabs. And then we have the Gatti wool factory, right? So we have isostatic bending lines, very clever mm -hmm. design. Another patent, right? He patented a lot of things you were telling me. 
he chose this form uh, having an experiment on a transparent plate. You have this um, uh, possibility to see how during the deformation of the transparent plate uh, the forces goes inside the plate. This is photoelasticity maybe. So, Absolutely. So photoelasticity Absolutely. through photo polarized light you can see the, the way that the stresses or the forces move in structures. Yeah. So you see that natural path of the forces in the patterns of this slab in the Gatti wool factory in Rome. So this idea of using the isostatic bending lines for Gatti wool factory, it wasn't Nervi's idea, was it? It was somebody else's? Oh, yes, but it was a worker of the Nervi and Bartoli, so he, they worked together. In fact, it is, uh, uh, the name is Aldo Arcangeli, and uh, the patent, in fact, uh, um, in the patent there is also his name. If we look at an image of some of that formwork, we can see that formwork, which was again in ferro cement or ferro concrete, the same thing. Uh, we see them on the platform on this movable scaffold, and we see how it forms part of that pattern that would become the permanent pattern for the ribs of this structure. Again at Princeton, my colleagues, uh, Sigrid Adriansen, David Billington, along with Alison Halpern, made an analysis of this. They, with using modern computer methods traced the isostatic bending lines. So in red we see the primary isostatics, which is the maximum bending moment, and in blue the secondary isostatics, which is the minimum principal bending moments, and we see how those lines done by modern tools today do trace indeed the patterns of the ribs which are in the background of those blue and red lines shown in white. This type of construction would have been very costly using wooden formwork, maybe even not possible. So again, it speaks to the importance of the innovation that Neri made using both prefabricated and ferro cement. With this innovation, he's able to create these forms that weren't possible before. So in this segment, we have given some examples of Neri's mastery of construction and efficiency and aesthetics that were only possible because of his construction innovations that produced designs that were not only feasible to build, but also economical. Next, we're gonna look at four more masterpieces, all of which were being constructed at the same time for the 1960 Olympics. And Tuli, I hope you'll continue to join us as we talk about these structures. <laughs>